I can start now? Yes, sir. Okay, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in, wa man tabiyahu bi ishanin ila yumiddin, rabi shali sadi wa sili amri wa ahlul uqtada min ishani afqaw qawli, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa ta'ala wa barakatuhu. May Allah bless all of us. And I would like to, yeah, I mean, to thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making it easy for us to uh, have this meeting today. And today we are going to have this class number six. And uh, we are needed to finish the worldviews. And today, this is the last part about the varieties of the worldviews uh, from the Western perspective. Uh, here I have, uh, before we go to the three main ideologies, as we look at them from the scientific perspective, and they are the sub-supportive uh, uh, worldviews as far as the scientific worldview is concerned. So I would like to give you a brief uh, information about the developments that did take place in the West uh, that led uh, later on to the establishment of these three ideologies that we have selected, uh, materialism, secularism, and postmodernism. Now, if we go back to the, to the, sixth, to the 14th century, uh, most of the Western philosophers, they consider this as the age of reason why? Because it is uh, the age of reason. That is the moment that uh, the Westerners, they started to allow, if I said themselves, uh, to use reasoning. And that was a kind of opposition towards uh, the Catholic Church. That was the dominant uh, authority during the time in the Rome, I mean in the, in the Roman Empire. And everything started in Italy. And they call this, why? Because as it is mentioned here, uh, so most of them believe that since man is a rational being uh, and everything that is uh, created by God is a rational being, then God is a rational being, then uh, there is no need for another rational being like God to, to dictate on another rational being that is man and to tell him what he is supposed to do, you know. So in other words, uh, we can say that that uh, age introduced uh, the humanistic approach as far as the, the world is concerned, about as the, the way how they understood the world. And uh, later on, so it is like 200 years, uh, that proce process did take place. Uh, we had humanism, that we had the Reformation uh, movement that was introduced by Martin Luther who was influenced by humanist movement that did take place during that time. Another age that is very important that contributed to the development of this uh, scientific worldview and other ideologies is the age of enlightenment. Uh, so we can say that uh, during this time, it became very, very clear uh, the opposition towards religion uh, because they, they gave us uh, a kind of understanding during this time uh, that uh, people, uh, they have to believe through reason that there is a, a rational being, but they don't need a kind of supernatural God to tell them what to do, you know. So during this time, uh, when they started to study the scripture, especially the Bible, that was the most dominant uh, source of knowledge in, in the West, because we know that the Christians were, uh, and they are still the majority of that part of the world, so in order to look down at them and to get rid of the church authority, so these philosophers, they started to study the content of the Bible. And they look at the Bible, there were, there were many kinds of myth, and they said that uh, the scripture, it is not uh, a kind of supernatural uh, being scripture that is revealed to man by God, but it is a projection of man. It means that when they found this kind of... Uh, myth in the scripture itself, and they were trying to uh, get rid of even the, the, the word that is meant to be uh, a part that was revealed by God. You know, when you look at the Bible, the first part of the Bible, uh, that is a revelation. The other parts, uh, yes, these were introduced by man, and this is the contribution of man. Uh, but this is how they're trying to look down at that, you know, during the age of reasoning. And here we have the development of many 
methodologies that they studied religion scientifically. And later on, at the end of the age of, I mean, 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century, this is considered as the age of ideologies. Or we can, uh, we can say that during this time, many ideologies were introduced. Uh, perhaps we can say, uh, even though the, the philosophers, uh, they wanted to maintain the philosophical approach, uh, but others, like even here, we have names like Mar uh, I mean, uh, Marx, for example, uh, and others, and Nietzsche, uh, some of them, they were uh, inclining more towards materialism instead of philosophy, you know. But most of them, they use philosophy in order to interpret the facts, in order to interpret the facts. And many ideologies like philosophical approach was introduced during that time, psychological approach was introduced during that time, phenomenological approach, uh, anthropological approach, and all this we can say that why they were opposing religion, they started to study religion scientifically with the help of archaeology. So that is why these ideologies were introduced and this is the age of the, uh, the development of many ideologies. If we look at Nietzsche, for example, uh, he says that only reason, uh, when you look at during this time, that was a kind of movement that the poor and the disenfranchised, these marginalized people, want justice is so that they seize political power. And the only reason that the powerful ones teach toleration and benevolence is to keep the disenfranchised under their control. So according to him, uh, both of them, both parties, whether the marginalized or we say the masses and the elite, they were trying to go to control the things, you know. So it means that that was a kind of selfish motivation according to Nietzsche. Uh, both parties were trying to, to, uh, to get power and control the others. And here he looked down at uh, what Jesus taught to them, like love and forgiveness, uh, and calling him the, like a pale enemy. Why? Because when you look at the uh, values that are introduced by religion, so love should be there and tolerance should be there, you know. But according to this kind of uh, uh, movement during that time, so they wanted to get rid of all things that were coming from religion. So they, were, they wanted to replace this with the contribution of men. And later on, we have the age of analysis uh, in the 20th century, uh, and it was introduced by uh, some of the philosophers like Sartre, for example, James and Russell, uh, they believed that during this time, everything that was considered to be uh, meaningless or illogical and people could not understand it properly, perhaps that is during the time that is how they attacked religion indirectly, you know, or even directly. So they were trying to uh, allow people you know, to have the desire to analyze or examine the mystery behind this. And who is the mystery behind all this is men. So they wanted man to, uh, to understand things that he introduced for himself. Uh, everything that was considered as a symbol uh, in, uh, that was introduced by religion. Uh, so uh, during that time, they allowed to analyze by looking at it from the human perspective. Uh, therefore, they were trying to introduce a kind of approach that uh, will be uh, equivalent for everyone. So everyone will try to assimilate it's himself and everything that he has in that kind of society. Uh, perhaps we can say this is the time that uh, pluralistic uh, ideology was introduced. And you see here, like they consider that religion is an unnecessary evil. Why? Because they consider everything that is introduced by religion will create problems, you know. And we have to bear in mind that during this time we had the First World War and the Second World War. And for everything that happened in that part of the world, uh, they blamed religion. Uh, therefore, they said, why do we need religion? So we don't need religion. We, get, we have to get rid of religion. So that was a kind of uh, guideline that I have uh, presented to you in order to understand the development of these uh, worldviews. And this is just a general observation by looking at how uh, from the humanistic perspective, these worldviews were introduced in that 
part of the world. So we have to understand this, that the material, I mean, all these secular and postmodern worldviews, uh, they are all established according to the way how man understands himself and his place in this world. So it means that everything is uh, considered as according to the way how man is looking at the surrounding and how he interprets them. So it, it is uh, another thing that everything it is maintained according to the way how man understands himself. Therefore, there is no need for divine beings or laws, you know. So in other words, we can say, if we have this kind of approach, uh, then the, the humanists, they develop for themselves two groups of people. Uh, the first one that is atheist and the second one that is agnostic. So the atheist will deny the existence of any supernatural being, you know, God. So the focus will be on this empirical world. And the second one, agnostic, they, they are not sure whether God exists or not. We can say that is a, uh, they uh, try to understand the reality based on the skeptical approach, you know. So they doubt in everything. And uh, later on, we can see that how these movements have helped the, the Westerners to develop themselves. And the worldview that was developed by the Western, it, it has a cultural flavor. In other words, we can say that it was culture that became a universal uh, reality and religion became uh, one's aspect of life. So we can say that how uh, slowly they did marginalize religion. So here we can say that the culture-based worldview that dominated the, the, the West, uh, it introduced uh, other different types of understanding that were based on human free will, reason, and science. So now there is no room for any scripture or any religion or, or any ideology that goes beyond this world. Even they were very particular about the philosophical worldview, you know. So we can say that this is a pure uh, materialistic worldview that is focusing on the way how humans perceive the reality. Uh, but within the, the limits of the empirical world, they don't go beyond the empirical world. So here, the, it, everything is, depends on the assumptions uh, that people would like to know how the world, not only how the world is, but they would like to contribute how the world should be, you know. So that is something uh, that uh, man contributes to everything. And at the same time, both individuals and societies, uh, they have to contribute to create this world they desire. How do they create this world that they are willing to have it? By applying the reason and the scientific methodology. So that will enable them to construct how they believe the world should be. So that is very important here that we have to understand uh, how the culture-based world in the West paved the way to the establishment of this scientific worldview that under it uh, are the sub-branches, materialism, secularism, and postmodernism. So here we understand that this paved the way to the development of these uh, three uh, other worldviews that are supporting the scientific worldview in the West. The first one that is materialism, and we look at it as a worldview, secularism, and postmodernism. So now we look at all this one by one, briefly, you know. So when I look at materialism, uh, here I look at it uh, as a worldview. Uh, we have to understand those who contributed and how did they perceive this ideology, you know, and how they did establish a material worldview. Uh, so here I have referred to some of these uh, great uh, scholars in the West, how did they change? They started from philosophical perspective, then they ended up as materialists. And one of them, it is Friedrich Engels, and you know that he's uh, one of the contributors of socialism, and later on how communism was established. Uh, so both of them uh, who contributed to this ideology, they come from Germany. And according to him, materialism, he says that was born first in England. When there, a person who, who was called Dan Scotus, he asked whether it was impossible for matter to think, you know. So it means that they wanted to focus only on matter world uh, in order to let people understand that if matter is, uh, is understood in that way, then we don't have to link ourselves with uh, the unseen or with the divine being. So then later on, he says that 
beside when this question was raised, then the one who contributed most was Francis Bacon. Uh, so he was attached to the Lord Chancellor of England during the time, uh, during the 15th centuries and the beginning of the 16th centuries. And according to them, later on, he betrayed uh, uh, the Lord, you know, then he, uh, I mean, uh, he, uh, he was exiled. Now, according to Bacon, he believes that science is based on experience. And of course, I mean, in order to understand it further, he said that uh, how we understand this based on experience, that is how it is understood through the senses to a rational method of investigation. It means that everything that is understood through the means of science uh, should be understood by the help of the senses. And through that, they can do the investigation while they're dealing with any uh, subject. And here, here it is how this, uh, uh, I mean, uh, approach should be understood. And he argues that that uh, should be a kind of induction, analysis, comparison, observation, and experiment. So all these principles that are or were introduced by Bacon, uh, they form what we call this scientific method. And later on, we can say that uh, how the matter was, uh, for example, at the early stage. But that motion, it was like a mechanical motion. It was a mechanical motion, and it doesn't have any kind of uh, volition, if we say that. It doesn't have any kind of feeling. But they were trying to understand that these are very, uh, I mean, they are very equal. They are very equal. And this is the only way how to replace uh, the spiritual aspect of uh, the world. And he said that when they look at the matter, they consider this matter as dynamic as the spiritual aspect of life. So in other words, we can say that uh, they thought that this matter is able to, to make man understand the reality according to them. But how, matter will un how man will understand matter uh, through this, I mean, the, the understand reality through matter. And they thought that it is matter that has developed the human mind. So by looking at matter, by having this kind of motion, so this contributed to the development of the human mind. Uh, therefore, they said that gives rise to defined theory as far as matter is concerned through the evolution. When they look at it, body and mind, sensation and thought, the external world of matter, movement, and the inner life of human soul. So how they are going to understand this, especially when you look at the last part, the movement and the inner life of human soul. So they were trying to uh, look at it from the material perspective by uh, providing certain tools of measurement in order to evaluate uh, the, the worldview that was presented by religious people and how to refute that, you know. And here, two, two groups were developed as far as the material worldview is concerned. The first one who claimed that, the, uh, and they gave priority to spirit, uh, uh, to nature, that is idealism. And the second one, they regarded nature as primary, that is materialism. So we can say that uh, the first one was going beyond, this is the philosophical approach. And the second one, that, that is the material approach. And we have another German scholar who contributed and he changed his approach from being idealistic, uh, following the philosophical approach. He uh, later on changed to the materialistic approach. Uh, so as it is mentioned here, he was a follower of uh, the Hegel or Hegelian uh, philosophical approach. And later on, he became an atheist and uh, I mean, tried to establish the materialistic approach while studying the, the, the subject. And for him, he said that the material or sensory perceptive world to which we ourselves belong is the only reality. It means that whatever is beyond this, it is not a reality. And our consciousness and thinking, however, super sensuous, that may be observed, are the product of material, bodily organ, the brain. So it means that everything that is framed later on by man, it is done through the human reasoning. Therefore, it will become a human product. And here, matter is not a product of mind, according to him. Why? Because matter, it is higher than the human mind. So if that is the case, 
then matter contributed to the establishment of the human mind. It is like it is the physical body of a, a person that contributed to the development of his mindset. So that is, a, if we say that that is how they were, uh, I mean, trying to focus more on the material world and to get rid of uh, the, the religious point of view. And another way how they understood when you look at it uh, directly as a worldview, so they said that uh, based uh, when they look at the reality, uh, so one of the most important element that is matter uh, has no feeling. You know, when you look at the materialistic worldview, uh, it's important element, it is matter per se. But they said that that matter doesn't have any feeling, you know, that matter doesn't have any volition and no specific purpose. Then how this matter contributes to the development of uh, human mindset, you know? That we said that the man is thinking, but if matter doesn't have feeling, no volition, no specific purpose, then how this will help man? And we understand later on how Karl Heinrich Marx, he said that there is no God, but the God of economics. So everything according to materialism is focusing on the material well-being. So wealth, they talk about wealth, how to progress and how to get rich, you know. And they said that at the end of the day, it is matter that exists, whereas anything else that doesn't belong uh, to the scope of the matter is rejected. And uh, when you look at secular, so these are, uh, if we said that they are related with one another. Why I started with materialism? because that is how at the early stage uh, they were trying to study the empirical world. And later on, that led to the development of secularism as the main ideology uh, under which other ideologies were introduced. But here there is a difference between materialism and secularism. So when you look at its uh, secularism as a worldview, uh, we have to understand the term, how it was derived. So it comes from the Latin word, seculum, that refers to what? A generation or an age or belonging to this age or worldly aspect of life. In other words, we can say here by looking at this definition is not different from what materialism introduced to them. Why? Because uh, it focuses on the empirical world. And it involves uh, that everyone should acknowledge uh, the existence of this world and all realities that belong uh, to this world. Other than that are denied. When you talk about transcendental realities that are not subjected to change. So they are trying to tell us that everything that is subjected to change, that is the only reality that is accepted by the secular worldview. Whereas other than that will be rejected. And here easily they, uh, they divided between profane and sacred. You see, they were trying to tell people, now the most important thing that you have to focus uh, should be what is introduced by man and is not uh, what is introduced by the supernatural being. Even though people, according to them, try to understand this according to their perception. And here we, we do understand that according to them, uh, secularization process, it is understood as the liberation of man from religious and metaphysical tutelage or guidance, you know, everything that is linking people with the unseen so it was secularization process that liberated men from all these problems, according to them. And uh, I mean, uh, making him to focus more on this world and to, to have a material development. Now there are certain elements and here we, according to what the Western scholars, when they discuss secularization, so there are three important elements that we are going to look at. The first one, this enchantment of the nature, that is how, uh, with this element, they were trying to get rid of anything that is, or it has a religious flavor. So to, to get rid of all these natural phenomena, from there, according to their magic or religious meaning, you know. For example, there are many religious symbols that will unite the people, you know. So they were trying to get rid of these symbols by looking at them as a product of men. And even when you look at the scripture, for example, that religious people claim that this is from God, so they were trying to get rid of this, you know. 
and looking at it as a product of man. And they uh, are trying with this element to tell us uh, that they have to free not only the, the human uh, mindset, but as well as the nature for all this, for, from all these religious overtones. Like when you have people, they worship the tree, they said that the tree uh, is not, uh, uh, I mean, a, a, a subject that should be worshipped or an object that should be worshipped. Uh, or let's say anything that is uh, considered as a center of worship. Uh, and they said that there is no any kind of uh, such thing like divine. Uh, everything it is uh, considered as a secular entity or empirical entity, you know. And further, uh, they start to focus more on the development of conscious powers uh, when it comes to the way how people were trying to observe uh, and understand things, you know. It means that their secularism introduced uh, a type of measurement by having a culture flavor in order to evaluate what people claim, especially religious people. And here we can say that how uh, they managed to get rid uh, of all this uh, uh, supernatural understanding that were introduced by people and to provide a kind of worldview uh, that is free of all these religious tones. So in other words, we can say, according to them, that the way how they look at religion, that religion will create a kind of uh, scary or frightful environment. You know, people they will be afraid of. So now if we get rid of all these, then people will not be afraid of nature, but they have to uh, go ahead without being afraid of anyone. Why? Because man is the master of everything, according to them. And the second element, that is the desacralization of politics. So up to that time, we understand that in the West, it was the, the church that was uh, the only authority to decide uh, for the judgment of the people. Now, later on, uh, through this secularization process, they got rid of the, this kind of judgment by saying that there is no any right to be given to the church authority to, de to decide. So there is no any rule that should be uh, undertaken from the divine. Uh, everything should be done by uh, the people and his reasoning. Uh, and later on, you see that how the religious symbols, they got rid of them, all the religious authorities. Uh, here, as we mentioned at the beginning, here we can see the shift of power from religious authorities to the to the politics we can say that the, the governments were established and the politicians were the one who were deciding without uh, taking any uh, consideration from the religious authorities and the last element that is deconsecration or relativization of values so it means here uh, when you look at religions or the teachings of religions they do provide values that will provide complete security for people. Like let's say if we are afraid of injustice, then we believe that justice will be served if not here on the day of judgment. Uh, but here, if we get rid of that kind of perception, then these values will, uh, will, I mean, will be destroyed and people will not feel any more secure. Why? Because all this ultimate claims that are introduced by religion uh, will, will be, uh, I mean, deleted from the minds of the people. And the second point here, they, when they look at the no longer direct expression of the divine will, why? Because there is no divine will, you know? According to them, uh, the only will, it is the way how people will to do things. And values have become valuations. So here they don't look at all these religious, if we say teachings, or virtues, if we look at it from Islamic perspective, as values, but they start to evaluate them, whether they're right uh, and to be accepted or rejected. But of course, the way they evaluate them, it is not done based on the teachings of that particular religion, but it is done based on the secular worldview. And as it is mentioned here, uh, so everything, it is a product of the human history, and as such, it is partial. And if it is partial, it's subjected to change. And you know, this is not the divine projection, but it is a human projection. And at the end, man is the only 
uh, mystery behind everything. And here, we, uh, the, the worldview that, uh, if we said the perception that was introduced by the secular worldview about the reality, so even though they got rid of believing God, but they introduced another system that people start to believe in it as God, you know? Like here, when they introduced the concept of growth and inflation. So why in, in, uh, in uh, our today's world, uh, the, especially, the governments are very worried about inflation. Why? Because inflation will cause many problems, you know? People, they will become jobless. Uh, therefore, here, in order to maintain balance in the society, uh, where destruction will not take place, they believe that there should be a continuous progress and development. Uh, therefore, here, as I have understood growth, it is understood as the concept of God in, uh, in secularism. And inflation, that is evil because that will cause destruction uh, and people will be, uh, as I mentioned to you, that will be jobless uh, and they will not be able to survive. And in other words, we can say that when you look at secular societies, religion should be considered as individual affairs, you know, or personal matter. Uh, so you don't have the right to go there and preach your religion. You can practice it uh, in your individual life. When you come out to public, then you have to live like others. Therefore, during the time, even today, we have many uh, even some uh, among the religious people have been influenced by this worldview. Uh, they said that you don't have to tell me what to do, you know. I know what I'm supposed to do. Even a Muslim will tell you that. Now, the last uh, worldview that comes under the scientific worldview, it is postmodernism or postmodern worldview. Uh, we know that this postmodern worldview, it was a movement that did take place uh, in the late 20th century. And it, it was a kind of uh, opposition towards the values that were introduced by modernism. Even though those who introduced this postmodernism, they were, uh, if we said that, very attached to modernism, but they thought that th there would be another chance to go ahead. Uh, they were looking for further developments, you know. Therefore, the focus of postmodernism and how this movement did take place, it was art-based movement. It was an art-based movement, you know. Uh, why? Because they claim that uh, there is a, a kind of general distrust, for example, of grand theories and ideologies that were introduced by modernism. Therefore, we have to, uh, I mean, look at, to, to change that and provide a solution to, to, the, to the future of the people. And preferring practical results than doctrinal answers. Uh, so they were, uh, they became very skeptical in that way when they look at it from the religious perspective. So they wanted to see, uh, like we said, that even though you claim to be a Muslim, but we want to see that uh, whether you live according to Islam or not. Uh, therefore, here, but they don't look at it from that perspective, you know. And for them, spirituality is uh, important when this will provide solutions to the problems that, uh, uh, I mean, are faced by the members of the community. But how we can say, how God, can God help? to overcome my problems, for example. Uh, will that be considered as an individual approach or the, will that be considered as a communal approach? And uh, the last point, if you look at this subjectivity, uh, they said that it is truth if it is true for me, you know? So if it is not true for me, then it is not truth. It means that everyone has the right to reject or accept uh, the truth as truths that are claimed by different people, you know, in that particular community. And here we have identified uh, seven, I mean, elements. When you look at here, seven elements. Uh, the first one, we just mentioned that there is no absolute truth. And under this, we understand that the idea of religious pluralism is taking care of this. Uh, because here, uh, they said that uh, the absolute truth is that there is no absolute truth. You know? It means that everyone is equal. They talk about equality here. Even though we come from different backgrounds and we have different worldviews, uh, but they said that whatever you claim, that is not the truth. It means that why? Because there is no truth. You know? uh, they look at it from their perspective. They look at it from the postmodern perspective. Uh, 
And that uh, will lead to the second one, that there is no reality. If there is an absolute truth, then it means there is no reality. So reality here, even we look at, when we look at this world, they are very skeptical, most of them. You see, it under postmodernism, and many of them in the West, they are living under this worldview, and they have become skeptical, and they doubt even in this world. You see, that uh, that is the reason why they easily commit suicide, you know? Uh, because they said there is no reality. Life is not real, you know? It is like you are dreaming. Uh, that is how they understand things. And the second one, I mean, the third one is only sumel krium. It means that everything is based on imagination and speculation. Uh, we, when we discuss scientific worldview, uh, even the philosophical worldview, we said that these uh, things are based on imagination. But now they are including everyone. So everything that you see, it is based on imagination. And they are trying to speculate facts. So we said that how come this is based on imagination when uh, through the senses we understand that this is a concrete thing, you know, that we touch, we can feel it. Uh, then we observe then how this is based on imagination. And that paved the way to another element that is meaningless and valueless. For example, here, and this is very dangerous, and Muslims are caught by this, you know. Uh, through postmodernism, they are trying or, and they are doing that, reviving the outdated culture, traditional values. And they are going to dig for these values in every religious communities. And they have started this long time ago when they targeted, if we say that, uh, after 1960s, when they targeted the Muslim communities, and even today, you know. We can see that today they are uh, telling us that this, uh, the teachings of Islam are not the one that you are supposed to follow because you, you just embrace Islam later on. But the one that you have to follow, you go back to your tradition, go back to your culture, you know? And this will create a problem for every religious community and especially the Muslim community. And here another very dangerous, uh, uh, I mean, concept that is introduced under this element, humanization of religious institutions. So they will never stop, you know, as long as uh, opposition is there towards uh, religion uh, in general and Islam in particular. So this will be there whether we like it or not. Therefore, even in, in Islamic education institutions, we have this kind of approach, you know, uh, like they talk about human uh, education instead of Islamic education. They start with what is human, then what is left, just let them teach about Islam, you know, but priority should be given to the human product. And there is total doubt, what I mentioned to you before, no confidence in life as such, skepticism, and this will lead to destruction. If you don't have self, I mean, uh, confidence, and this will not increase your self-esteem, then how we are going to produce, for example, if we have this kind of perception? When we face problems, uh, then we doubt whether we are going to have a good result or not or whether life will be, uh, that I'll go through, will be happy, or I face many problems, you know. So therefore, uh, when you look at religion and Islam per se, provides us a complete uh, worldview that facilitates everything we need in this world, as well as in the hereafter. And another problem, if we said that was introduced by postmodernism, when they talk about multiplicities of truths even though that started during the age of analysis, if we said that. But during the time it was emphasized, and we had many among the religious representatives, even Christians, uh, they objected that. But now it has become, in the last uh, 30 years or 40 years, and even now, this is dominating. Uh, like they talk about multiplicities of truth, truths, ethnicities, you know. So that is how they divide the religious communities under the umbrella of ethnicities, you know, and cultures. And we see that religious people, uh, they govern uh, their life not according to uh, religion, but according to the differences, you know, like ethnicities and cultural values that they have. And here, under the, here, the, the most important thing that is introducing all this, they look at it, that everything is diverse in nature. And here is we can apply Darwin's theory of evolution. When he said that at the beginning, everything is multiple in nature, is a multiple organism. 
and later on people selected one among this multiplicity and we see with this postmodernism the westerners are leading people back to, you know, if we look at darwin's theory and when they studied these primitive societies you know so they are sending people back you know, to the early stage of the, the development according to them an equal uh, representation for class gender for example male and female are equally in all aspects uh, they don't look at it that physically you are weak as a female uh, and uh, you are physically strong as a male they don't look at it from that perspective so everyone is equal uh, like what we see now a female she is a wrestler you know like a male and a female and a male they are fighting together you know why because they bring in this kind of approach you know and here we look at the sensual orientation like same gender marriage freedom of expression one's feeling for the same gender you know and these people opening their openly you know they don't they don't fear anyone you see they're not afraid of anyone whereas we muslim why we should be afraid when we want to express ourselves freely you know you see these people they express themselves freely everywhere anywhere and when we try even our muslim brothers are going to object so that is our weakness not only among the muslim but among other religious people so I think this is very important when you look at these uh, sub worldviews that were a result of the scientific worldview, but they are different a bit. Why? Because of the development that did take place in the West. And with that, Bilal Tawfiq, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi ta'ala wa barakatuh. Alaikum salam wa rahmatullah. We have a question by the Shamswar Hamka. Would we say that postmodernism bring back the Sufis age to our time? No, I don't think so. The Sufi Sufi age was, uh, of course, it has a divine uh, divine orientation. You know? When you look at the Sufi age, it 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 has a divine orientation. Whereas postmodernism doesn't have a divine orientation. Uh, so everything it is based on man, and they get rid of divine orientation. From Brother Nuruddin, can you explain the influence of postmodernism on the emergence of anti anthropocentrism philosophy? For example, in the case of the COVID 19 outbreak, there was a discourse that humans are the real viruses that damage the earth. Yeah, I mean, people have different views, you know, when I look at it, but uh, if we look at the reality, it might be, you know, because when they don't care, uh, especially the elite, who lives uh, under this worldview, I think the, most of the masses are not aware of postmodern worldview, you know? But we look at the elite, most of them, they are aware of this reality. And uh, according to them, they'll come out with anything because as we mentioned, when we look at the elements of the postmodern worldview, uh, they are very skeptical, they doubt, you know? They don't, when they don't care about their life, how, they, how they, should they care about the life of others? And I think could be the possibility, uh, Allah alam, you know, because we look at the facts, uh, the cause and effect. Uh, we Muslims, when we look at the reality, uh, so if it happens, then we, we don't have the right to discuss anymore because everything is based on kada and kada, you know. But it could be the possibility, you know, from their perspective, from their perspective. Huh? From Brother Samsul Idul Adha, is there any relation between the philosophy of Averroes, Ibn Rush, and the Western philosophy? Now, if you look at some of them, the Western philosophers, uh, even though when you look at uh, Marx, for example, he said that Bacon is the one who introduced materialism, even when you look at secularism, but some of the Western, they said that secularism started with the Muslim philosophers. Because the Muslim philosophers, they were trying to interpret uh, things even related to God from a rational perspective, you know. So that was the mistake that was committed by the Muslim philosophers. Uh, even though we can say they contributed, uh, they gave us uh, some good parts, but they did a big mistake when they're talking about particularities and generalities as far as God is concerned, you know. I think that was a fatal mistake that was done by the Muslim philosophers. And of course, if they argue on that basis, we don't see any difference between them and other philosophers. Uh, this is how we understand, you know, and we know that the Muslim 
philosophers like Farabi, Ibn Sina, and others, they were the one who developed the Greek philosophy. They put it in the proper form, you know. And the Westerners, they found it ready and they just developed it. But later on, when you look at these methodologies or worldviews that we just discussed, uh, they don't look at it from even philosophical point of view. Because they, they try to get rid of anything that belongs to the metaphysical world. Oh, I, I hope this is good. Yeah. I read somewhere that these Jewish philosophers, most of them are affected by the Holocaust during those um, massacre of the Jewish people. Is it true that because of this tragedy, they change their mind, become more pessimistic religion? But I think those who are behind the ideologies, they were, be, I mean, they were before Holocaust. You know, Holocaust is very late, you know. When you look at all these who were behind this Karl Marx, you know, Freud, Durkheim, and all of them, they were, they were Jews, but it, they were a long time ago, you know? And I think this Holocaust, it was not because of religion. Everybody knows that. It was because the Jewish, they interfered into the politics and the state of Germany, you know? But the Jewish people, they have changed this into a religious perspective, saying that because we are Jews, therefore Hitler, uh, killed us. You know, you read there are many books. Even recently, a Jewish rabbi was saying that, you know, he was saying that this is how, why Hitler, uh, I mean, the Holocaust did take place, and there was no such kind of Holocaust because they bring this uh, Semitic approach, you know, like a kind of anti Semitism. So, what about Muslims, you know? So, aren't we Semitic? Yes. Aren't they killing Muslims? Yes. So, why don't they, isn't that the Holocaust that we are going through? Yes. For how many years? Almost 100 years, you know. Why Jews are very particular? Because of this policy, you know. So this, these are the ones who are governing, if I say, the world. Uh, so may Allah make it easy. You know? Yeah. Here from Brother Imran, as a Muslim who is highly exposed to these philosophies, how should I integrate my Islamic lifestyle within a community of this philosophy? Now, if you look at it from the Islamic pers perspective, Islamic worldview gives or gives us a balanced worldview. So we don't have to go into this kind of philosophical as they introduced to us. Why? Because this might create a problem. It is like you are inclining yourself to one aspect of life. Whereas Islam provides a very simple worldview that can facilitate us and everyone can understand, you know. And we have seen those Muslim philosophers who have gone into details, they provided a methodology that is not understood by masses, you know, even by learned people. Uh, they reached to that level, some of them, even we have some contemporary Muslim philosophers, they provide a literature no one can understand except them. So this is not what Islam wants us to do, you know. I think this is, when you read the Quran, we understand, everyone understands the Quran. So that should be the methodology that we have, or the knowledge that we have to provide for ourselves, uh, not to go to all these extremes, you know. What do you think about the quote from a Muslim scholar? I went to the West and saw Islam, but no Muslim. I got back to the East and saw Muslim, but no Islam, based on the Islamic world. Now, if we say that, of course, I mean, during the time, if you look at the West uh, compared to what we have today, the West, uh, they were better off. Why? because there was the, the, the peak, if we say, of the Western civilization. We, we are talking about the, the end of the 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century. And there was a discipline, you know, there was a system, if we say that. Therefore, these uh, people like Muhammad Abdu and Afghani and others, when they went to the West, and we have even Sir Ahmed Khan, you know, from India. So when they went to the West, they were impressed by the system that they had introduced. They were very, Materially, we talk about materially. From material perspective, they were better off compared to the Muslims. And therefore, this made the Muslims, uh, when they compared with what they had back home, they said, we see Islam in the West, and we don't see their Muslims, you know? Why? Because that is Islam. Islam provided for the Muslims before what the West, uh, Western provided for themselves, you know? But during the time, and we have to bear in mind that the destruction that was uh, done in the Muslim world by the colonizers. And in order to promote their values, 
So that is how they made the Muslim even scholars to get confused, you know, because they destroyed everything in the Muslim world. That is the reality, I mean. Uh, so if you read, and even today they're praising themselves. Why? Because what we have back home, uh, it is based on corruption, you know. And when you go there, but today we can say that it's not like uh, if we compare with that time. Uh, the West was better off if we say that. Why? Because postmodernism, they started to talk about career based education. And now recently they have realized that this career based education destroyed everything, uh, doesn't have value. You know? Now, some of these uh, in the West they introduced some, there are few universities, are the most expensive universities that they combine both, you know, you see they're coming back, they understood that this is, it doesn't work, you know. Almost 100 years they introduced the disc destructive methodology that destroyed other parts of the world. Why? Because as I mentioned before, it is a kind of selfish approach, you know. Uh, the West doesn't want others to dominate. Uh, the Western culture should dominate. Uh, therefore, they, anyone that is standing in front of the Western culture uh, should be destroyed, you know, and they are telling us that we did. We didn't do that. I mean, Muslims did not use that approach, you know, uh, so they didn't say that other cultures should be destroyed. So other cultures were allowed, other religious communities were allowed, as long as they did not create any problem. But you look at the West, even today, you know, humaniz humanization is a, a continuous process, whether we like it or not. Uh, so we have to be very careful as Muslims to understand what they have and how to respond. So we don't have to bargain here. You see, like accepting what they claim is not what Islam wants us to do. We have to introduce to them the Islamic worldview. Why should we accept the Western worldview? And what should they accept the human, uh, human worldview no? that they have introduced, especially in the education? Why they target education? Because that uh, is destroying the whole community, you know, whether we like it or not. So please, we have to be very careful as intellectuals uh, and we have to guide the masses. Uh, you see many Muslim uh, among us, uh, they are not aware of this fact, you know. They will accept things unintentionally. And then when they realize they have entered that particular group, you know, and it will be difficult to bring them out. So we have to be very particular. So whether we like it or not, it is there, you know, everywhere. Brought from Brother Shu'aib, uh, what role does diverse cultures play in Islamic worldview? We see within the Muslim communities worldwide, there are different cultures that has caused different practices which may be not authentic or even permissible. Now, now if you look at it from Islamic worldview, Everyone that becomes Muslim, he can practice any culture value that is not against Islam. That is very clear. No? And when Muslims come together, they have to get rid of these culture values uh, that contra will create a contradiction among them. So that is very clear picture that Islamic worldview is presented to us. Now, when we are living with others, so if they accept to live with us, like in Malaysia, for example, so we have to tell them, any culture values that will cause harm to the community should be uh, avoided. As simple as that, you know. But if you look at the West, they don't even allow us to practice um, the teachings of Islam, you know. Or if we say that the symbols that represents our identity as Muslims. Uh, why they focus more on culture? Because for them, culture is a human product, you know. That's where they talk about this culture diversity. Uh, and under this, a religion will be put somewhere, you know. If you go to the West, even though they say that we have democracy, uh, but they are very particular. So when you are going to enter one education institution there, so they are, uh, when you look at the reality, they, you are not allowed to bring in religious symbols. But if that symbol is representing one, one's culture and is not related to religion, you are welcome, you know, because this is what they promote, you know. I think this is very clear, you know, very clear. So I think what Islam provides, and if we look at other religions, if they practice it properly, is better off compared to what we have. But if we say that, if we look at the, the, the scientific worldview, as we have discussed, and these worldviews, so they're claiming that everything is a human product. 
So I have mentioned before, this is supporting us, you know. If they don't look at Islam as such, and if they look at Muslims, we might agree. Because some Muslims, they behave according to what they see is right, and they become selfish. They don't live according to Islam. So we can say, maybe that, as I mentioned before, if we look at before that, why this, even today, when you go to the West, we can see some kind of justice, you know. We can see some kind of justice. So what they need now, they need the Islamic approach, you know, to complete what they have introduced. You see, it's very easy for a scientist to embrace Islam, but it's very difficult for uh, a Christian, let's say, or a Jew, or a Hindu, or Buddhist, a learned person to embrace Islam. It's very difficult. Rarely we can find. Why? Because the scientists, they have very pure, you, know, you see, they use, if they use the pure human uh, nature and intellect and reasoning to study the empirical world, then they will uh, find the, the truth, you know. That is say, of course, everything depends on whether Allah wants them to be guided or not. That is how we believe. But if we compare, you can say, they have, there is something in, in this world with that is accepted by Islam. Okay, Whereas the rest, yeah, the rest is... We have from the Kaaba, from Shukriya, Brother Ghalib, and the rest, but time's up. I think you need longer time to summarize, Prof, this, today's topic. Okay, for final words. Okay, okay. Now, we are living in a very, if we said that, difficult situation as Muslims, but if we live according to Islam, easily we can overcome these difficulties. You know? Because there is nothing that will pose any challenge to Islam. But others, they can pose challenges to the Muslims if we do not follow Islam properly. So what we have discussed today, I think this will uh, be a kind of a reminder for us to read about Islam and to live according to Islam. Uh, I think that is the only solution how we can respond to what is going on in, in the contemporary world and in the future to prepare ourselves for the future. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for listening. And this is based on my humble understanding uh, while reading and teaching these subjects. I hope this will be very beneficial to all of us and a reminder for all of us. And thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Okay, Prof. Thank you so much. I surely hope.